my question is, um, and you had mentioned about uh, you know the kingdom of God, um, uh, you know, being reintroduced uh, by John the Baptist, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, obviously there was there was quite a big big gap between you know when it was uh, when uh, you know, God actually introduced it and then you know it got, it got reintroduced, mm -hmm. but in that in the meantime there was there were a lot of you know really uh, great uh, you know prophets and you know. Uh, Men, men of God, uh, you know Isaiah, Moses, uh, Joshua, you know so many others. So they did not have the kingdom of God. So what did they actually have? What did God actually, uh, you know, give them to you know to be able to be such great men of men of God? That that really is my question. Yeah. Yes, yes, Christopher. Yeah, that's that's a, a question. Yeah, because only after the Lord Jesus came and salvation. Uh, was uh, bought for us on the cross. We receive it and we are saved. We are born again. But you know, experiencing the kingdom of God before that, uh, that we could say was happening. Only thing is uh, John the Baptist and, and the Lord Jesus, they began preaching about it and in its fullness, the kingdom came through the redemptive work of the Lord Jesus. Now, what, what uh, happened before that? How did uh, people... Uh, experience the kingdom. You see, in the book of he Hebrews, we see the shadows, right? We see the shadows uh, of worship uh, given through the tabernacle worship and the temple worship. Okay, so there were quite a few practices there uh, where where uh, the people had to go and seek God for forgiveness, uh, right, and uh, uh, make atonement. Things like that. So when when the people engaged uh, in uh, aspects of worship in this manner, uh, you know they were they were continuing to experience the kingdom. They were continuing to experience the work of God in their lives, and that's how God was working. That's how the kingdom was uh, being demonstrated uh, in the Old Testament and up till the cross. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Christopher. Does that uh, help? Okay, right. Yes, thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, in that manner, uh, people were still experiencing the work of God, and you know, you see the demonstration of the the power of God you know, at various prophets, right? Like uh, people like Elijah and all. What power is that? It is the power of the kingdom. It's the power of heaven uh, that that they were releasing as well. Okay. So uh, that's how it was. Uh, any other questions before we uh, move further? First, I have a question. Yes, yes, who? I, I heard somebody preaching about the uh, kingdom of God, but he was preaching about the uh, kingdom minded leaders. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he said that we, as uh, servants of God, our minds must be for the kingdom of God. And he said that. Uh, we must, uh, maybe we as a uh, local church, maybe there is a ministry. So uh, that local church must support the ministry without expecting anything from me. It's something which is very difficult to, to support some ministry which you don't know. And they say by doing so, you are acting as a kingdom-minded leader. So because we are starting today about kingdom of God, and uh, I, I think that this question might... might <laughs> Help me to understand mm -hmm. me so I cannot get something which is heresy and the distract in our local church. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, hope that is a that is a correct way of thinking, because you know when we all realize that we are part of this kingdom of God, um, now that we are born again, you know we will not be limited in our understanding. Like we will not think, oh, just my church, my fellowship my cell group, uh, you know, and that's it. That's about it. And I, I shouldn't be extending support to others. But when you, when you have this perspective that we all belong to the kingdom because we are born again, uh, despite the fact that, you know, uh, people may be from different churches, that brings in that kingdom mentality. And what uh, the preacher that, that you heard said, it's the right thing. It's the right thing. You can't support others other ministries um, and uh, together we are all building the kingdom of God at the end of the day. Okay, so it's a good thing.
but one one point i'll add to that is don't do anything by force or by compulsion okay so just because somebody is saying you have to support that ministry or this ministry you go ahead and support it but that that is uh, uh, not the way that it should be done however uh, the the thought of extending support to other ministers of god other ministries people of god in general uh, we are encouraged to do that in scripture and that's a very very good thing okay pastor thank you but uh, i you 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 talked about john the baptist uh, and uh, yeah. really this question to me it is very important because he is the one who made a way for jesus to come he preached it and he baptized people but uh did he born he, you say that about born again and uh, really this question it is it is very technical and uh, if you you find that somebody who has a tendency of reading scriptures and you, and he or she is not born again and he ask you you tell me that john writes that uh, in the beginning there was a word but who is john did he been born again what will i answer him or her so when you give us more clarity about john the baptist because he was not born again because we say who believes in jesus who confesses and uh, he was he he was there before jesus how how is, can we explain it and uh, people to understand us so yeah. if you could yeah. That, yeah yeah yes so uh, see hope the the defining moment in history right uh, where where uh, god's redemption was completed was the sacrifice of our lord jesus on the cross of calvary so everyone who uh, could receive that after what jesus did so we use the term born again because only after jesus died and you know he he paid for our uh, sins are we in a position to receive that work of salvation and so the term born again comes into the picture but before that you know before that i already told you there are many things established in the practice of worship uh, you know in under the old covenant where god had um, you know provided provision for people to experience the kingdom of god so uh, just because there were people who lived before the the cross it doesn't mean that you know they they cannot be a part of the kingdom they were very much a part of the kingdom okay and it doesn't uh, like i i i'm not saying that somehow john the baptist uh, you know we we will revere him less because uh, he didn't live after the cross not at all john the baptist is the forerunner uh, and uh, we we honor him he brought the first message of uh, repentance and the kingdom of god okay so uh, would that be okay oh, okay great yeah thank you thank you so much okay so uh yeah we will continue on with uh, our uh, study here uh just to cut out the outside sound if you don't mind i'll just uh, close the door i have the door open Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, let's uh, continue with our. Oh, okay. Thank you, Christopher. Somebody wants to be let into the class, but I don't see anyone waiting. Yeah, maybe you could ask them to uh, try again, clicking on the link. Yeah. Okay. Sure. All right. So uh, here in the next chapter, we will uh, focus on. uh um, god as the king of this kingdom so so far we've uh, uh, talked about the fact that there is a kingdom okay and this kingdom can be experienced uh, spiritually and uh, eventually there will be a literal kingdom uh, but we as believers this kingdom is for us and we can live with that kingdom perspective now we will uh, study a little bit more about the king of the kingdom the king and his kingdom uh, and uh, i'm sure all of us will agree uh, uh, if i say that the ruler or the king uh, of a country is very very 
uh, you know, who the ruler is is very important. Okay? Uh, because if he is uh, cruel, if he is, uh, um, you know, if, if he's not mature, uh, if he is selfish, uh, then you would you would see the consequences of that on the people. Okay. On the other hand, if the ruler is is a, a righteous person, is a just person, uh, if that ruler is, uh, you know, we can just use the general term, good person, uh, we can expect some good government upon the people. For us as God's people, you know, this is the great news that we have a good king. We have a very, very good king. And uh, as we understand his nature, so we will realize that we can always trust uh, his rule and reign upon our lives, upon the world that he has created, because uh, he is, is good in so many different ways. Uh, and as I began this morning, we have a picture of the nature of God uh, covering other aspects. Uh, for example, if I say that uh, God is the creator, many of us will relate to that. If I say uh, God is our savior, many of us will relate to that. But you know, God as king, uh, we might not have you know, a very, very good understanding uh, of it. So now we'll, we'll try to get a better understanding. Uh, there is a passage in our notes here from uh, Psalm 145, verses 1 uh, and uh, 10 through 13. Okay, we won't read it. I, I'll just uh, say, uh, I'll just say the first scripture here, it says, I will extol you, my God, O King. Okay, so scripture does introduce God as the King. And further, when you read the other scriptures, there, there's also the term kingdom that is used, your kingdom. So we are told that God is our King. And what do we generally do when, when we uh, watch all these movies that have kingdoms, people bow down, people uh, worship, people adore, people uh, you know, extol, praise their kings or their rulers because they hold them in high regard and in honor. So just think about this. We have a king who is good and this king is God himself. And so how much more should we praise him? Uh, and honor him. We must give praise to this king and you know, sing his glory and exalt him. We must recognize his greatness. And, and that is very, very important. Yes, we are talking about all the benefits of belonging to the kingdom of God. And you know, many, many of uh, many a times, even for me, that, that is helpful. It's advantageous to know, oh wow, kingdom of authority, and I can have the power, I can demonstrate the power. But what about honoring the king? Of that kingdom and giving him the due worship uh, that he deserves. Right? And I, I'm sure we can never worship him as much as he deserves. But you know, at least we we are there in that position of worship and we honor him because he is the great king. Right? And scriptures uh, describe him as this almighty, powerful king who deserves our praises. And so you know, we we uh, sing praises to him. We, we bring our honor to him. And this king, right, he stands in authority over our lives. There's a scripture, uh, uh, Psalm 44 and verse 4, which says, You are my king, O God, command victories for Jacob. Uh, command victories there. Victories, you can look at it as uh, God command prosperity over my life. God command blessings over my life. God command you know, healing. Uh, joy, peace, success, all of that command victory over Jacob. Jacob, we are the people of God. We are called as Jacob uh, in, in this uh, scripture. So when God is in authority, when he is in rule and reign, you know, and we as sons and daughters of this king, we can always ask the king and say, can you please command victories over my life? And that is a privilege that you and I have, that we can directly uh, approach this king because of what Jesus has done. And we can ask for these blessings. We can ask for his dominion uh, upon us. And that is something that you know we, we must never forget. Now, 
studying a little more about this king and his nature he said that he is a great king um, and he deserves our praise he deserves our worship now this king uh, uh, every king we know that he he or he is the picture of final authority so our god has the final authority and when we talk about the authority of god we know that he is an eternal king so uh, it's not like somebody gave him the authority or somebody can take back that authority from him but he always had and he always will have that inherent authority and so you know that that gives us a revelation oh wow he is in such a position of dominion this king uh, and uh, our hearts only can bow down and worship uh, you know this this kind of king so his authority is final okay whatever he plans you know that is final uh, and nobody can take away his power from him this king every king whatever he says uh, that word becomes the the decree that word becomes the law of the kingdom the same here today when we study the word of god we belong to this kingdom and these are the words of the king right so uh, that should help us understand what authority they carry and how we we must see the word of god uh, established in our lives uh, and uh, how it's it's almost like you know the law uh, that is established in the kingdom so god's word we hang on those words every single word because uh, it is the final authority the presence of the king right the presence of the king so uh, again if we think of uh, the grand march the entry of the king into his palace into his courts then you would you would find uh, all the the ministers in in that place rise up because he carries a magnificence he carries a majesty he carries the glory right and the very presence so we use that term a lot the presence of god but you know realize that the presence of god is the presence of that king so if you are in the presence of the king you know how uh, how do we respond to it and what does the presence of the king mean again there is authority and dominion in his presence wherever his presence is there is authority and dominion okay so these are all uh, these are all different aspects that we understand about the king uh, and his rule and reign and as the king of course you know the name uh, carries great authority just by the name of that king uh, access would be given to people to to uh, forbidden places things that would uh, uh, be hidden hidden treasures just by the name of that king and today you and i have the name of the king of kings so that carries authority okay, that name carries authority and when we exercise our authority through prayer we talked about this and we pray in the name of jesus you can only imagine the power that it carries and the king right the king fills his kingdom and his expression is in the kingdom his expression who he is is in the kingdom now who who is this this king uh, uh, isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and 7 it's a very very familiar passage usually during christmas uh, people would read this out and say for us unto us the child child is born unto us a son is given the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end upon the throne of david and over his kingdom to order it and establish with uh, judgment and justice from that time forward even forever the seal of the lord of hosts will upon it so there is a description given of the king uh, with various names is called wonderful uh, which in other words means miraculous so if you look at the, the hebrew uh, meaning it's associated with miraculous okay? counselor counselor is what expression of uh, the wisdom of god then you have mighty god mighty god is the expression of his power Uh, everlasting father that's the expression of his compassion the love care of god father 
so uh, that's who he he uh, becomes to us and he is then the prince of peace that's clear to understand you know, the shalom of god for our total well being so in the very name of god which is described in this passage you now we can realize all that he brings uh, all all the authority that he carries right and, and everything that is released to us because of who he is and his name his rule and reign so uh, you know we we will see him for who he truly is so he is that magnificent great god miraculous full of wisdom and power uh, compassionate at the same time and his rule and reign we are told is a rule of righteousness okay so when we have a good king a righteous king uh, there is great confidence we are secure as his people not at any point uh, are, are we thinking oh man what if god decides uh, you know contrary to his word what if god does something evil against me no because we are very clear uh, his scepter is the scepter of righteousness we are told in hebrews 1 and verse 8 so he is a righteous god and he will rule in that manner and this god right he is worthy of our honor and our worship and we must choose to honor him and there are many ways that that we can honor him um, we can uh, recognize who he is okay and there is a tribute that uh, uh, nebuchadnezzar uh, gives him in, in daniel chapter 4 where he describes this great god and you know whatever uh, this god has done in in his life so in that same manner you know when we when we come to god and we respond to the revelation of who god is and we say god you are this righteous uh, king you are this uh, this ruler oh, oh god who brings peace in my life god you are ruling and reigning with wisdom uh, in my life uh, thank you for for your miracles the release of your power in my life you know, i'm just recognizing the authority i'm recognizing what this king is doing how he is uh, you know how his dominion is over my life and i'm just beginning to give glory to god so first thing we can do is to acknowledge acknowledge who he is how magnificent he is and how uh, even loving he is and how great he is as our king we can also worship him and we are told to do that we are told to worship him and honor him and this praise and worship uh, it can be done in various ways right so we we won't get into all of that but you know we can just take time to sing to the lord Uh, for the good king that he is uh, we we can take time to you know dance to the lord we can take time to just bow down prostrate before the lord and uh, and just uh, you know give him uh, our reverence so there are many ways in which we can praise and worship uh, this king and we need to have the revelation uh, of god as a king as well and how uh, did this king get introduced to us we talked about john the baptist coming and uh, preaching and then jesus himself coming and preaching but think about this you know god could have left it he he could have just stopped with john the baptist the four runner you go announce about jesus and that's it right however you have the king himself hebrews 1 uh, verse 8 it also says the son right so the son uh, is the one who has come from the father and he is the king himself but he has come to proclaim his own message and he has come to fulfill his own message right so the introduction of this king to this world uh, is is done in a in a marvelous way that the king himself has come showing and revealing himself to us and you know that is the beauty of what god has done it's not just the message but as a person he has come bringing us this message of the kingdom of god and introducing himself as the king and uh, the things that he did in introducing the kingdom of god and himself you know we talked about it earlier we said that uh, he preached the good news of the kingdom of god uh, but along with that you know, he 
taught the principles of the kingdom of God. But there are several parables that we will look at a little later on. So there are different principles of the kingdom of uh, God or the kingdom of heaven that the Lord Jesus uh, taught his disciples and a demonstration of the power of God. Right? So through the, through the miracles that he did, the healings and deliverances, he uh, released the kingdom of God. So in all these ways, he went about uh, revealing the kingdom of God to us. Now, a little bit has been mentioned in our notes about the, some of the principles of the kingdom. So I'm just going to you know, uh, uh, go over them very quickly. One principle uh, that is uh, given here on page number 12 uh, says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So just think about this. You know, we are here in the world and uh, there is a way in which the world goes about uh, everything, right? Life here on the earth, there's a way to do life. But if you're doing kingdom life, you're living from a kingdom perspective. The kingdom principles sometimes may seem even contrary to the worldly principles. Okay. Uh, one example is, you know, if you are least in the kingdom, if you are least here, like you, you serve, you become a servant, then you are exalted in the kingdom of God. But in the world, if you go and talk about things like this, they'll say, oh, come on, you know, you have to promote yourself. Otherwise, how are you going to uh, gain recognition? But in the kingdom, we are encouraged to serve and become a servant. So there are many such principles of the kingdom of God and they can be applied in uh, various aspects of our lives. Excuse me. Yeah. And uh, here we're told that those who are poor in spirit, there's is the kingdom of heaven. So poor in the spirit refers to a hunger. Okay, it does not mean uh, you know poverty like the general poverty uh, that we see. That's that's not what it's referring to. But poor in the spirit, it's a hunger, and we know that hunger will create an appetite, right? So you can have more of something. So. In that context, those who are poor, blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if I want to receive the kingdom of heaven, I've got to be hungry about the things of the kingdom. Now, if I feel like, hey, I don't want to know too much or I already know enough uh, and the life that I'm living for the kingdom is good enough, nothing more, then I will not be able to attract more from the kingdom. But a hungry lifestyle, a spiritually hungry lifestyle where, where I, I want to see more of the kingdom, right? The, the power of the kingdom, the principles, okay, how do they work? When I'm hungry in that way, uh, I will experience the kingdom. So that's a, that's a principle that we see here. When we are persecuted uh, for righteousness sake, uh, scriptures tell us that the kingdom of heaven is ours. So this encourages us. So in the, in the world, for the sake of uh, um, you know God and doing the right thing for God, we might experience opposition out there uh, uh, in the world, or it could even be our own families, you know, because we're standing up for God and we're standing up for righteousness. But in that, we are encouraged. Why? Because Scripture says that we belong to a kingdom. Okay? And in that kingdom, if we undergo persecution for righteousness, we're actually blessed people. Right? So, uh, you know, those who don't understand this, they might think that, hey, what is wrong with you? Your people are calling you names because you're, you're uh, um, following Jesus and all and it doesn't affect you. But you're doing the right thing. And you also know that I belong to a kingdom. Right? And in that kingdom, if I undergo persecution for the sake of righteousness, I am actually rewarded. Okay? So things like that. So when you understand the dynamics of the kingdom, the principles of the kingdom, you realize some of them can be very, very different 
from the principles that the world has. And uh, we are called to um, live it out. We are called to teach these principles. And the Lord Jesus himself did that. Okay? He taught them. He also lived it out. And the kingdom of God, uh, uh, there are a few more thoughts here about the kingdom, which uh, I, I will add out. It says, thy kingdom come. Yeah. So we are encouraged to pray and ask God for, the he for heaven's rule and reign to come here on the earth. And I think I've described that earlier. Uh, and then we must also seek the kingdom first okay? and all other things will be added to us. So these are some principles. And uh, also uh, doing the will of the Father. When we do the will of the Father, that's when we are told that we enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so uh, these are some things that the Lord Jesus taught us and we will look elaborately on, on some of the teachings a little later on. So for now, we realize that the kingdom of God was introduced in a marvelous way here on the earth because the king himself came and uh, he uh, spoke the message. He also demonstrated the kingdom. He gave us teachings of the kingdom. So at this point... Yeah, any thoughts, any additional comments from all of you? Uh, Pastor, we just enjoyed the class. Really, it's so amazing. And uh, uh, we are happy to see you again as uh, oh, yeah. we Thank were you. Best here. And uh, we are happy because we, we do not have other teachers who we start with as, as Marshall Samuel, but uh, we are happy to to see that we are we are proceeding with you and uh, we are blessed to learn about kingdom of God and uh, I learned a lot today. So God bless you, Pastor Nancy. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Hope. Thank you so much for that. And I'm also happy to continue uh, with all of you. And hopefully we will continue the next year as well. So please, uh, it's not easy. I know it's really not easy to to uh, study, cover all the subjects, and put in all the hard work, but uh, we got to give the grace and do well in this semester. So we are just coming back to uh, our subject here on the kingdom of God. Uh, any any comments on what you've heard so far about God as the king? Okay, Dinesh, what is the meaning of scepter? As per context of Hebrews. See, scepter is generally carried uh, by a king and uh, uh, th with the with the moving or the raising of a scepter, uh, you know, you, you see that a king would direct or, you know, he, he would, he would, uh, uh, it's not instruct, but it's like his decision, Right? So if he moves the scepter in the book of Esther, you remember, she enters the presence of the king without his permission. And uh, we are told that those who entered the presence of the king without permission were killed. But Esther did it. Okay, uh, And she said, okay, if, if I die, it's okay. Let me go. But when she does that, the king actually extends the scepter on her. So the decision of the king upon Esther is, my favor, I give you my favor. So uh, that rule of getting killed in my presence, if you enter without permission, doesn't apply to you. So the scepter is the rule and the reign. It demonstrates the decision, the authority of the king. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Finish. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, since you know we, uh, it it is a it, it is somewhat simple to understand king and kingdom. So uh, we we have grasped whatever was uh, talked of uh, till now. Let's continue. Uh, here in chapter three, we talk a little bit about the church, okay, and the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God, uh, it's actually. Mm, quite huge it encompasses uh, the the kingdom we will see that you know it's not just the kingdom here on earth but there's also a, a kingdom in heaven where we have heavenly beings we have those who have gone on you know, after living their lives for christ uh, so the kingdom of god 
has us in it, but there are others as well who are part of the kingdom. But the church, right? The church uh, on the earth, it is a representation of the kingdom of God. Of this heavenly kingdom, and we are truly emissaries. Emissaries are, in other words, what Rupa mentioned: ambassadors, representatives. Uh, ambassadors, in the Bible times, you know, they would they would carry such authority that they would go to different regions to establish, like for example, the Roman Empire was expanding really fast, uh, and so they would send out these ambassadors. They would go to a captured place, right? And over there, they will establish kingdom culture. They will establish, uh, you know, their kingdom, the Roman culture and the Roman uh, government and all of that. So uh, the ambassadors had a very, very powerful and influential role to play. And today we are seeing that we as believers, we are emissaries, we are ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven. We're living here on the earth, but we are really here to extend that kingdom. And we're also told that this kingdom has authority. Uh, if you recall what we studied in uh, prayer and intercession from Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 uh, and 19, Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Okay, notice that keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven so as god's people we have been given the keys keys representing the authority of the kingdom okay and so we we can release that authority we are representing uh, the kingdom of heaven and we can also release that authority here on the earth. And we are told that the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Another beautiful thing here is that uh, you know, Jesus said, I will build my church. So if the church has that authority, has that kingdom authority, what kind of authority? We are told that the gates of hell will not be able to withstand. Okay? Uh, and notice Gates of hell refers to stationary structure. Gate, once you fix it uh, uh, in your uh, compound, it will be there wherever you have fixed that gate. You know, it's not going to go anywhere. The next day it's going to be there. So Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But at the same time, he said that the church has been given authority that he will build that church and the keys of the kingdom have been given to uh, you know those, those who are part of that church so we know that the church is that influential uh, body of christ the church is that powerful entity representing the king, kingdom of god which is able to move okay we are able to move and the gates of hell do not move so we can actually go out we can find uh, you know, the works of darkness and we can destroy the works of darkness. You know, that's the kind of authority uh, that Jesus has given the church. And he said that he is going to build this church. He is going to establish this church. And the church refers to each and every one of us as believers. You know, this only captures the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the kind of victory that you and I can walk in. In the last semester, we talked about believer's authority, right? Believer's authority. So just think about this. We have kingdom authority. We are the sons. We are the emissaries. We are the ambassadors. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. And the Lord Jesus, he has already redeemed us. And he has given back uh, that authority that Satan had taken from us. And we need to understand and walk in that authority okay uh, now when we look at the early church i'm on page 17 in our notes if some of you are wondering where we are so i'm just trying to cover some ground give you a summary of things um, if you look at the early church they they were a people who understood the authority of the kingdom you see so many marvelous demonstrations of the the power of god through through the apostles and the believers 
okay uh, and uh, the lord jesus he taught about the kingdom of god to these disciples when he uh, uh, was you know walking with them before his trial and uh, crucifixion and all that but even after that the 40 days after he is the resurrected christ and you know you study um, acts chapter 1 and verse 3 we are told there that jesus spent time with people he was seen in different places uh, but one of the things that he also did was to speak about the kingdom of god so the early church one thing that we can be sure of is that the early church had a good understanding about the teachings of the kingdom of god they were they were uh, a church of great authority they walked in great power they had uh, you know the teaching of the apostles but they also had teaching about the kingdom of god so you know, uh, i'm sure they must have had the teaching about the authority of the kingdom of god okay. now they had it and they also took it with them wherever they went so in Acts chapter 8 we see philip okay, philip as a minister he goes out uh, to to um, serve in Samaria, and over there we are told that Philip he preached concerning the kingdom of God. Okay? So the early church and the people of the early church definitely had the uh, understanding of the kingdom of God. And similarly, as you keep looking at different people, Paul and Barnabas, that there, there is a scripture that says that they were also. Um, uh, preaching about the kingdom of God, uh, Paul at Ephesus you know, when he talks to the people. Three months he's there at, at Ephesus. He is reasoning and persuading uh, with the people of Ephesus to to make them obedient to the gospel. One of the things that he spends time on is the kingdom of God. In Acts 19 verse 8, uh, we are told persuading, uh, the reasoning and persuading concerning. The things of the kingdom of God. So the theme, kingdom of God, uh, it was a very, very integral theme for the early church and the apostles. And in whatever they did, you know, they carried that along and they spread that message of the kingdom of God and the authority of that kingdom. And we today, as, as uh, the people of God, uh, we must embrace this, this uh, uh, revelation of the kingdom of God and serve as workers, right? Workers and co workers. Uh, Colossians chapter 4 and verse 11, we are told uh, that, and I'll read it for us. Okay, we just have a little bit of time, so let me read that for you. And I'm on page number 19, Colossians 4 and verse 11. It says that Jesus, uh, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Okay, so, you know, Paul is writing to the Colossians here, but use the look at the term that he uses for the people who serve together with him. He calls them fellow workers. Okay, going back to the question that Hope asked us, uh, there's a certain ministry, can we help them? Yes, you can, because you know there are so many, so many people who are part of the kingdom of God, right? It's the it's the broad kingdom of God, uh, and uh, even Paul, he's calling people who served him, right? For for uh, Colossae, he's calling them fellow workers. So there are many people who uh, serve together, and they are our co-workers in the kingdom of God. So I think I will just stop here and we will uh, uh, move forward from here in the next class. But just a little bit of introduction about the church as uh, an ambassador and the power that the church has been given uh, and the fact that the early church moved with this knowledge uh, and they took this knowledge to various parts to uh, you know, tell uh, the new believers that they are part of the kingdom of God. So yeah, uh, we, we will uh, stop here for today. And uh, I think it'll be good if we can wrap up with some, yeah. anything, any thoughts? Yeah.
Um, hi, Pastor. Hi, hi, Sam. Now, I'm just thinking, I don't know if we will cover this in the later section, but since we're in the topic of church, yeah. Yeah. Um, just some, um, some thoughts around, um, you know, uh, how and why was the church kept as a secret kind of thing um, throughout Old Testament? It's, it's, I think, only Jesus Christ who kind of revealed uh, God's plan for church. Um, so just um, any thoughts around that, and um, and also I think um, this verse um, in Acts uh, chapter one to where uh, Peter, you know, you know, after the Holy Ghost comes, when Peter declares to uh, to the audience there that this is what Joel had uh, already. Prophesized that yeah. in the later days. So I, again, that scripture doesn't. Up, I mean, I, I I always get confused. Like, you know, does that uh, scripture apply to what Peter was saying? Because uh, if uh, if Peter is claiming that, then uh, you know that. Sorry, sorry about my background noise. No, no, that's okay. But uh, so because it doesn't apply because. Uh, Joel could not have got an extra revelation of the church and the apostles during his time. But yet Peter uses Joel to uh, Joel's confession. Mm. So a, a, a little bit around that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, Sam? Uh, so Sam, uh, just to go back to your first question, um, I, I, I think there were two parts to it, but I, I can only remember one. So please... Uh, interject if you would like you said why was the church kept as a secret you know what uh, the church you don't see that it was kept as a secret in fact whenever we talk about uh, the book of acts after the resurrection of jesus once he ascends and the baptism of, uh, of the holy spirit takes place it is described as the birth of the early church so it's a new entity so there's no question of hiding it Testament. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the thing. But yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, basically, the people of God, you mean, right? In in the Old Testament and in Jesus' times. Well, they were very much there. They were very much there, and uh, uh, maybe the kingdom of God is a better description for them. And the church became a better term, uh, which was used after. Uh, you know, acts of the apostles. Yeah, sure. So that, that would be uh, my uh, comment on your first question. Uh, and the second question where Joel, you know, Joel's prophecy, he says, uh, you know, your sons and daughters shall prophesy uh, and um, your, once again, Joel chapter, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 2, I'll tell you the exact verse. Yeah, so prophecy of uh, Joel from verse 16, Acts chapter 2 and verse 16, uh, Peter stands up and he says, you know, this is the uh, this is what Joel said, that uh, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams, even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below and blood and fire and pillows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay, so he uh, says that. And uh, actually, I want to show you one more scripture. Okay, so there, uh, I'm not able to locate it, but uh, uh, a verse where he says, This is that. Okay, can you have to see it? It's in the same passage. Maybe I'll find it and I will tell you. Okay. 
okay, I wouldn't want to waste your time. Uh, but yeah, so I will uh, tell you that exact scripture. But basically, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happens, and you know, uh, Peter uh, shares the prophecy of uh, Joel, he tells the people, brethren, you know, what you see here happening, the outpouring. Uh, of the Holy Spirit, uh, this is that. Now, of course, uh, the demonstration was different because in what Joel said, he said that people will prophesy, there will be, um, you know, there will be dreams and, and things like that. But what exactly was happening in that upper room was people speaking in unknown tongues. But by the Holy Spirit, you know, Peter was able to reconcile the two and he actually makes that statement. You know, he says, this is that. Once people begin to speak in tongues, he, he says that, he says, this, what you see is that which Joel uh, prophesied. So uh, I would say by the Holy Spirit, Sam, that's how he was able to reconcile the two, the prophecy of Joel and what actually happened in Acts 2. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Ma'am, Acts 2.16. 16. Yeah, thank you, Rupa. Thank you okay. for that. Somehow I just missed it. Acts 2, 16. Okay, yeah, my, my uh, uh, version is different. So the English here is different. But yeah, is NIV Acts 2, 16? Uh, in NIV it says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So this is that. Yeah, so he he um, clarifies that the prophecy of Joel has been fulfilled. Right. So uh, yes, uh, uh, class, we uh, will you know think about these things further, and it will be good if you can also read and come. So from the next class, you know, I, I'll try to uh, summarize it not kind of go every section section by section but uh, i'll try to summarize it so that we have some additional time to discuss uh, application and uh, you know practical aspects so it'll be nice if you can read up and come uh, we've stopped in the middle of chapter three right now uh, we could complete reading that and maybe chapter four and five for the next class and that will be really helpful all right, so uh, thank you. Thank you once again for joining in today. And uh, we will meet again uh, next Tuesday. Okay. And if you have more questions, please post it on the stream page and uh, we will take it up over there. Thank you. 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 Thanks, ma'am. Thank you, Dinesh, Pati, Angi, Samran, Avni. So good to have all of you back. Thank you. Bye. Bye for now. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Rose, Hope, Felix. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Abhishek. Bye, Siddhant. Abraham. God bless you all.